Today I'll be moving from linear regression to logistic regression. As always, we'll start with our goals for today. We'll one, learn about logistic regression. Two, make a figure with our data appropriate for logistic regression. Three, actually run a logistic regression in R. And four, and by summarizing our results in an R markdown document. Okay, let's start by going over the math of logistic regression. In the last lesson, we talked about linear regression. So I just want to take a moment to talk about how linear and logistic regression differ. In a linear regression, our goal is to predict a continuous variable, while in logistic regression, our goal is to predict a categorical variable. This can be something like true or false, or correct incorrect. Generally, it is a categorical variable with two levels. Also, in linear regression, we talk about our data in regards to mean and standard deviation. As a result, we'll often build histograms to see what the spread of our data looks like. For logistic regression, though, we talk about our data in regards to counts, so a bar plot may be a more appropriate representation of the data. Finally, in linear regression, we are predicting a specific y value given a specific x value. But in logistic regression, we're predicting the probability of a given level of a y category given a specific x value. Now I'll go into a little more detail of what I mean by this. Generally, when we talk about probability, we say it ranges from 0 to 1, with 0 0.5 in the middle. This maps onto a 100% chance, 50% chance, or chance as it's often called, and 0% chance. However, in logistic regression, we don't talk about probability in terms of the space. Instead, we talk about it in regards to logit space. Now, there are some key differences between probability as it's displayed in the left and probability in logit space. For one, 50% is actually zero, and the rest of the values range from infinity to negative infinity. So infinity is 100% chance, zero 50% chance, and negative infinity 0% chance. Notice you never quite reach infinity or negative infinity. So while you get very close to 100% or 0% chance, you never quite get there. If this is confusing, the important takeaway is simply that in logit space, zero means 50%. Positive numbers mean above 50% and negative numbers mean below 50%. Okay, let's go through the equation the same way we did with linear regression. Here is our equation for linear regression from the last lesson. And here is our equation for logistic regression. We can also rewrite the left side of our equation so it looks like this. Again, if this looks intimidating, all you need to know is that this left side of the equation is giving us our probability in log odds, or logit space. The right side of the equation looks almost identical to our linear regression. We have a, b, and x. The only thing that's missing is an error term. That's because we're predicting a probability. This error is included in our predictions. Okay. Now let's go through the equation piece by piece. The left side of the equation is the probability of a specific level of y, the dependent variable, in logit space. A is the intercept, B is the slope, and x is the specific x value, or independent variable. Like last time, let's try and better understand this with an example. For the lesson on linear regression, we looked at baby chick weight over time. We made a regression, which showed us that as more time went by, the baby chicks increased in weight. Now, how can we make this a logistic regression problem? Well, let's say we want to know if a baby chick weight is above or below the median of all the baby chick weights. Now, instead of our y values being continuous, various weights, they're categorical, above or below the median. It would look something like this. Here we see that all y values are either zeros for below the median or ones for above the median. Now we could draw a regression line like this, which shows that as more time goes by, more weights are above the median. But really, the stat doesn't have such a strict linear increase. Really, we have a line more like this, where at the beginning, it's all zeros, and there's a point where it shoots up and is pretty much all ones. This is why logistic regression is often taught with an S-curve, like the one here. Okay, now we can go through the problem the same way we did before, starting with a specific data point. Next, we go through each part of the equation for this specific data point. The x value is the time, here 10, and the y value we input is 1 or 0, in this case 1 for above the median. The intercept is the value of y when x is 0. So it would appear it's roughly 0, since pretty much all the chicks had a weight below the median at time 0. 
B, the slope, is still the increase in probability over time. Now displayed like this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Remember though that actually what we're predicting isn't ones and zeros, it's probability in logit space. So let's map our predicted values into logit space. These values represent our predicted probabilities in logit space for each of our data points. Remember, logit space ranges from negative infinity to infinity, and zero is 50%. Now our values look much more linear. Indeed, we can draw a straight line connecting them that looks like a linear regression. Now it's much easier to interpret the rest of our equation. We see that our intercept is roughly negative four, so well below zero at 50%. And our slope also makes much more sense. Now we can see that for each change in time, there is some increase in logit space as well. Let's try and put all this together. To really understand what's going on with our logistic regression, we need to consider both our raw input and our output in logit space. We start by picking a specific data point, which has a specific x value. In logit space, we have an intercept for the value of y when x is zero. In logit space, we also have a slope for the change over time. And finally, our predictions for our y values are also mapped onto logit space. So while in the input, our data point was a one for above the median, in logit space, our data point is a specific probability. If this is getting confusing, this slide should be your takeaway message. Your input for the y values are binary ones and zeros, representing 100% probability and 0% probability. Your model coefficients, such as the intercept and the slope, are in logit space which can range from negative infinity to infinity, and where zero means 50%. This will be, it'll be hard to really understand what these numbers actually mean, so the main thing you should focus on is are your coefficients positive, above 50% chance, or negative, below 50% chance. Okay, now we're ready to move to the actual R code. Once again, here's our equation for logistic regression. The R code is very similar to our code for linear regression. Before the tilde, we have our y values, so our ones and zeros for above or below the median. And after the tilde, we have our x values, in this case, time. There are two main differences, though, from our linear regression. One is instead of using the LM call, we use GLM for generalized linear model. This tells R we're not just running a standard linear model. There's also this family equals binomial call. This tells R that specifically, we're running a logistic regression. There are several different types of distributions you can use with the family call. Binomial tells R we have a set of ones and zeros to use with logistic regression. Okay, just like linear regression, we can call a summary on this model and get an output like this. Our A is the estimate of our intercept, here roughly negative 4.9. Again, the main thing we should take away from this is that at time zero, when x is zero, the y value is negative, so below 50% chance. Next, we have our b, which is roughly 0.5. This tells us that as more time goes by, the probability of the chick weight being above the median increases, since the value is positive. You should now have a good enough understanding of the math behind logistic regression and how to run it in R to conduct your own analyses, which brings us to today's lab. The data set for today's lab comes from the 2010 San Francisco Giants. I downloaded the data from retrosheet.org, which compiles massive amounts of baseball data for analysis. You may know of the book or movie Moneyball. In the movie, Brad Pitt, playing Billy Bean, works for the A's, and he and Jonah Hill, playing Peter Brad, use statistics to create a great baseball team with very little money. And actually, to do this, they use the programming language R. So today, we get to be just like Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. The only problem is I'm not an A's fan, I'm a Giants fan. So we'll be focusing on data from the San Francisco Giants instead of the A's. Okay, so in the 2010 season was very important for Giants fans, because it was the first time since 1954 the Giants had won the World Series. So we're gonna see today if there are any specific variables that predict which games they won and lost. First, we'll be looking at data from the full season, all 162 games, and we'll be asking, did the Giants win more games before or after the All-Star break? The All-Star break represents a roughly halfway point in the season, so teams are often discussed as doing well at the All-Star break, 
or maybe they weren't great at the All-Star break, but they played really well in the second half of the season. The second question we're going to ask looks at data from one specific player, Buster Posey. We want to know, in games where Buster Posey played, were the Giants more likely to win if Posey was walked at least once? If you're unfamiliar with baseball, being walked means the pitcher throws four pitches outside of the zone that the batter can hit the ball. And the batter gets to go to first base without actually having to hit the ball. Okay, let's break down our variables, starting with the full season data. Our Y variable will eventually be translated into launch space, which will be win or loss. Our A, we don't know. We're going to get it from the model. Our B, we also don't know. We're going to get it from the model. And our X will be before or after the all-star break. Moving to our Buster Posey data, we can do the same thing. Our Y variable is still wins and losses. Our A, we again don't know. Same with our B. And now our X is whether Posey was walked at least once or not. Pause the video now and start the lab as explained in the text below. There will be a few times you'll be instructed to look back at the video for some more detailed explanation of some of the code we'll be using. We've just had our first experience with an if-else statement. So let's break it down a bit. We start as always with our old data frame and our new data frame, and then our dplyr pipe. Our verb is mutate, which we've used before. Here, we're using it to create a new column. That new column we called home visitor, for whether the giants were the home or visitor team. Now, we can make our if-else statement, which is a conditional statement saying that the value of home visitor is based on a certain criterion. That criterion uses variable home team. And we assess it using a relationship marker. In this case, we use the equal equal sign to ask whether home team is equal to a certain level. We've used this early in our filter calls. The level we're checking for is SFN, which stands for San Francisco. So we want to know if home team is equal to SFN. And if it is, then we're gonna set our new column, home visitor, equal to home. So if our conditional statement executes to true, we write home. We also need a value if our conditional statement executes to false. And that will be visitor. So we've now created a new column, home visitor, with two levels, home or visitor, dependent on what the value of home team is. If this is unclear, try playing around with another if-else statement and see if you get the expected result. You can pause the video now and return to the lesson. Now we'll go over the details for the call we just wrote. We start with our old and new data frames, and then our dplyr pipe. Inner join is our first two table verb. Generally, all of our verbs, such as mutate and filter, have only been used on a single data frame. Thus, they were one table verbs. Inner join, though, performs a function using two data frames. Our original data frame, in this case data posy, and our new data frame, in this case data clean. Now, what exactly is interjoin doing? Well, let's start by saying we have a data frame like data posy. This represents just a snapshot of the data frame. We also have a second data frame, such as data clean. So what we want to do is combine them. The first thing R will do is look for a column or columns that the two data frames have in common. In our example, it is the date column. Next, R will look for rows that have the same values in our matching column. R then takes all these matching rows in the two data frames and combines them into a new data frame. Breaking down this new data frame, we see that our two matching rows for date are reproduced here. But in addition to copying over the matching column, R also copies over all the other columns from both data frames. So our new data frame has the opponent column from our first data frame and the day of the week column from our second data frame. In this way, we're able to combine two data frames based on matching rows. There are several other types of dplyr two-table verbs, which are very useful for combining and comparing two separate data frames. You can pause the video now and return to the lesson. This is our last new dplyr call for today. As always, we make our new data frame and add our pipe. Our first new verb is group by. Group by tells R how to separate the data so that any summaries are done within each level of a variable. In our case, the variable we are grouping by is all-star break, because we want to know how often the Giants won both before and after the all-star break. 
Next, we have our second new verb, summarize. It's in the summarize call that we say what exactly we want R to do with our data. First, we create a new column for our summarized data. In our case, we call it wins purse for percentage of wins. Then we supply the function to summarize. Here, I want the mean of win, so I can get a proportion for how often the Giants won both before and after the all-star break. This is another reason why it's good to use ones and zeros for the dependent variable instead of words like win and loss. I've also chosen to multiply the mean by 100 to make the output look more like a classical percentage for our plot. Finally, we want to ungroup the data. This isn't very important for right now, but it's good to get in the practice of ungrouping your data when you're, when you're done in case you later decide to do additional data manipulation and your output won't look right if it's still grouped from a previous call. You can pause the video now and return to the lesson. We've just made our first bar plot, so let's go over what that entailed. The first line of code should be old to you. It's the same way we've always started plots, with the exception of histograms. Then we add a plus sign, since we're using ggplot2 syntax, not dplyr. After our first line setting our aesthetics, we need to choose our plot type. We have the standard geom underscore, and then we use bar, so we're making a bar plot. Within our plot call, we have our method for plotting the bars. There are a couple ways that ggplot2 can make bars in a bar plot. One is to add up all the occurrences of each of the levels and plot that. But we earlier computed the exact numbers we want to plot. So by setting stat to identity, we tell R to use the specific numbers provided. Lastly, we add a scale so that our y-axis ranges from zero to 100%. This ends the video portion of the lesson. Please continue the lesson in the text below. See you next time.